Western big game hunters way underestimate the value of short range glassing. I can't see anything in this country. You just can't glass that stuff. Even if they were there, you could never find them. How many times I heard these excuses over and over, and that's in years of outfitting in wide open country. These are just cheese dick excuses, guys. If you use the short range glassing techniques I describe in this video in the right situation, you're gonna kill more elk, deer, and bears in the mountains than other folk. Not to mention, you're gonna be a way more flexible big game hunter. If you have no clue who I am, I don't blame you at all. My name is Cliff Gray, and I spent the past decade outfitting in some of the most remote wildernesses in North America. My insights and strategies in these videos is just based on that data set and experience, guys. All I hope is that you get some value from them. If you like my videos, subscribe to the channel here and go to my website, pursuitwithcliff.com and jump on my newsletter. So why does one need to view short range glassing as a separate skill set? Glassing is glassing, right? In a recent glassing video, you can check it out here called Glassing for Western Big Game. I talk about when glassing big country, the importance of glassing with the grain of the country open towards you. You don't want to be glassing perpendicular to the ridges and hogbacks. Instead, you want a glass with terrain features facing you or open towards you. This allows you to see more habitat edges, terrain features, and land mass from one point. When you can see a lot of country, you are long range glassing to find game or narrowing down the country. Implementing this with the grain tactic makes a big difference. What you're doing is you're processing exponentially more land mass, more throughput means more chances of finding game. That's true to all efficient long range glassing you maximizing how much country you're viewing from one location. In my other long range glassing video, I'll stick a link here also, glassing tactics for mountain hunts, I really pound on the tactics that give you the, the ways to increase the amount of country you can, you can cover effectively from a glassing spot. You know, things like choosing the ideal spots to glass from, changing angles in that location so you can see more, using the sunlight to open up the topography, all of that stuff. And that's about increasing throughput while you're glassing when you can see a lot of country. Those videos will be helpful to explain this point further for you. However, realize that when you do this type of glassing, high throughput style, within short moments, you are glassing to different distances, right? You're glassing to the back of the canyon, to the front of the canyon, and then you're glassing at different angles. You're glassing straight across the drainage. You're glassing below you. You're glassing above you. And you're also glassing across habitat edges and varying vegetation. Sagebrush to aspen, meadow to timber, river bottom to rim rock. When you think about how many different variables are blasting through your brain with this type of glassing, it's pretty stunning. Now this dynamic does reduce your ability to use certain tactics that would otherwise increase your chance of finding animals. You know the meticulous detailed aspects of looking for game. That's a bit watered down when you are covering a ton of varying country and dealing with all those variables. The meticulous approach is best used when short range glassing. So those differentiated things are what I'm gonna focus on this video. I'll go into all the scenarios next, but everyone gets caught in these short range glassing situations as a function of hunting. The one advantage you have over long range glassing here is you are almost always dealing with one aspect of terrain features and one type of vegetation. When dealing with one terrain aspect, you deal with minimal range differential. You're gonna be looking at a specific face, right? At a specific distance. You're gonna be looking at a rim at a specific distance, or you're gonna be looking at a thick bedding area at a specific difference. You know, that bedding area may start at 500 yards and end at 620 yards, or it might even be a tighter chunk of rim rock, right? Or chunk of timber, or, you know, timber finger, and that could just be a bound of 50 yards. Then you have one type of vegetation, right? It's live timber or it's timber with beetle kill. It's live aspen, it's thick deadfall aspen. You know, it's thick choke, bear, choke cherry or oak brush if you're going after bears. You get the point, right? You're limiting those variables. Obviously the amount of throughput, the amount of country you can see is limited by the circumstance, right? So you have to take advantage of the fact that your brain is dealing with less visual variables. I'll show you how to leverage that into success. But first, why and when does this situation arise? One, you are hunting tight terrain or thick vegeta vegetation. 
This is intrinsic to the entire landscape and the habitat the animals you're using. Right here, I'm in the northwest, you can see this country behind me. It's just thick, right? So easy examples are hunting elk, blacktail in the northwest, fall bear hunting feed sources, right? So really any country, even in Colorado or open country, you're gonna be focused on thick feed sources and canyon bottoms. Fucking bit by an ant. Two, you're gonna be hunting dry, hot conditions and heavily pressured game. In these conditions, almost all game animals become nocturnal, or at least partially nocturnal. So even in the widest open geography, you will be glassing thick vegetation, bedding areas, all that stuff. Really 70% of the hunting hours, if not more. I know some of you guys are gonna pop up and say, well, I just sleep when the game is bedded. Okay, I got you guys, a lot of the time I do too. But even if you're only glassing for the first you know, one and a half hours of light and the last two hours of light in over-the-counter elk units that get a cr get the crap hunted out of them, bulls are gonna be full-on already bedded for 50 to 60% of that time. Number three, while long-range glassing, glassing, you have seen animals move into a piece of country that you can't see into, even if you change your angle. You know, this is common for bedding areas, tight side drainages, hooks and topographies, that, that sort of thing. You're actually glassing big, but you see the game move into a smaller situation. In these situations, you will typically have to get sub a thousand yards and re-glass for that animal in thicker vegetation. This could be part of a stock or just could be to get a better look. Number four, you know the country well enough that you know all the hell holes that are high percentage locations for game, right? These are spots worth short range glassing because they've been so consistent over the years and they could just be a spot that you can't glass from another area, right? You can't glass it from those big long range glassing points. But the real point is guys, these situations are going to apply to almost every type of hunter on almost all species, just to varying amounts of degrees, right? Some guys are gonna use a little bit, some guys are gonna use a lot. Even in the wide open country or high elevation Colorado wilderness, is short range glassing was one of my go-to tools as a guy. Glassing up highly pressured bulls in thick deadfall canyon bedding areas or bucks laid up in those thick aspen dishes, that was standard operating procedure for me for segments of almost all the hunts that I guided. During fall bear season, it was my daily routine on probably at least half of my hunts. We are talking about glassing into stuff under 600 to 900 yards away. I always felt like this was an area that other hunters and guides overlook. Guys, I'm sure there are times that you find yourself glassing in the short range, you know, in the thick stuff, you know, for species and topography that I've never hunted. So shoot a comment below and let me know about that. I'd love to see how you guys could potentially apply these techniques and techniques that you use on your own, all right? So add those in the comments. All right, so short range tactics. Here we go, guys. First on setup, short range glassing isn't equipment centric, right? You can glass this stuff with chest binos, 15s, or even a spotter. I've done a lot of glassing at sub 500, 400 yards with a pair of tripod mounted 15s. This is gonna sound crazy to you, a lot of you guys, but I do it a lot. I find the comfort level with that setup is best for short range glassing. And this is that setup right here, guys. You know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you you gotta get a certain type of tripod, you know, even, even you gotta get the Swaro 15s. I'm not gonna tell you that, but this is the setup I like, right? I have a slick tripod, I've got an outdoorsman uh, head, and then I've got a pair of Swaro 15s on it. Lots of different variations, guys, but this is actually my preferred setup for short range glassing, right? I pr much prefer this over a set of just chest binoculars. Like I said, you don't have to have it, but it's my favorite set of equipment for this situation. Sometimes I carry a spotter over 15 magnification binos for non-related reasons, right? I'm judging game, I'm glassing longer range on other parts of the hunt, and that's all I have other than my chest binocular. If it is bright lighting outside, right? Like I got good lighting, it's not like the last minute of, of shooting time, that sort of thing. I'll typically use my spotter to do this short range glassing. And I just crank it down to 15, 20 magnification. Just so I get that exit pupil, you know, the, the, the variable for light gathering in the optic, get it big enough so it's allowing me to distinguish color. So yeah, you might see me glassing to 500 yards with an 85 millimeter objective scope. To some people, this looks like a guy with a mental problem, 
but it works. I really like the magnification at shorter distances. Sure, you're glassing shorter distances, but in a sense, you're glassing for smaller objects. You gotta keep that in mind in these situations. Game is, ob game is obscured more in these situations, and they are almost always bedded. Bedded animals from a visual perspective are about a third of the size of an animal that is up, up and feeding. If you think about it, just think about how much smaller I am here just when I'm sitting Indian style. I'm basically folded up and half of my profile is not visual to somebody that's you know down there or up here above me glassing. So it's the same thing with bedded game animal. Movement is also smaller on bedded game animals. Less whole body movements, more cud chewing, you know, tail wags, little ear flickers, that sort of thing. This stuff can get grueling. If you don't have a, a tripod set up and you are using your chest binoculars, I, I highly suggest in these short range situations where you're really trying to limit movement of your optics so you can catch those small movements of bedded animals, try to get something, even if it's your trekking poles, right? Here I've got my trekking poles. I can just sit them down. You can imagine me standing, sitting, however, and use them for support with your chest binocular, okay? That's one good way to use a piece of equipment to help you out. If your shooting sticks or whatever leave you at the wrong height with your chest binocular, learn to frame with your body. I talk about this a lot in other videos, but here's a quick review of it. Guys, so the ideal setup for framing in with a chest binocular is something against your back, a pack, a rock, a tree, all of that would be great to keep your back you know, the lim you know, limit your fatigue there where you're walking, rocking back and forth. And then elbows inside, framed inside your uh, knees here and then your binos here. This is gonna be the best way to limit, um, you know, limit uh, movement when you're, when you're using your chest binoculars for really meticulous glassing. I actually had a guy leave a comment and it made a lot of sense. What he does is he actually, with his fingers, while he's glassing, he grabs the brim of his hat, right? And that actually helps him limit more movement of the optic when he's short range glassing. I think that's a great, uh, great, uh, I think that's a great tip. Whoever left that, I'm sorry I don't have your name. I'm up here in the mountains where I look it up. Uh, I really appreciate that comment. So if you other guys have comments like that, leave them. Because I love to learn, learn more about this stuff too. And I thought, man, that's a good idea. When you just can't, you want a little more movement, use the brim of your hat to hold those chest binoculars. The other thing you guys can do if you're, if you're flexible and you're glassing down, what I found is you can, if you can actually lotus your legs, you're not everybody can, can you just, you gotta have a little flexibility, but if you can lotus your legs and pocket your elbows in the lotus position when you're glassing down, uh, this is a super sturdy position. I'm getting a lot of sun on the metal on my boots. So it's actually burning my arms when I set them down. But the idea is that if you can set your elbows into your feet in the lotus position and you're glassing downward, this is one of the most sturdy positions. I would say this is more sturdy than glassing with your chest binoculars in the upward Indian style position. But you have to have a downward angle. You're not going to be able to glass up because you got to pick your legs up and then you're going to be straining. Uh, you know, perhaps if you're against something, you know, like a tree, you could do that. But glassing down, you're, you know, you're glassing down into a basin. If you can do the lotus position and pocket your elbows, this is an incredibly sturdy position to glass from. So if you got a little flexibility, try that one, guys. Okay, another tip I'll show you guys on the tripod. One of the ways you can keep this tripod even sturdier is when you extend the legs. So a tripod's gonna start like this. They're gonna either have these kind of rolling locks or they're gonna have clips. The first thing you wanna do when you extend the tripod out is extend the thickest piece first, right? If you're able to use the tripod at the height that you need with the thicker uh, tubing, it's gonna be slightly sturdier versus if you pull the bottom one out first, right? This tube here against the ground is gonna give you a little less sturdiness and you know, movement limitation versus this one. Constraining movement is important in all glassing because it allows you to see more movement from the game. So let's hit that in the context of short range glassing. I'm looking for tiny movements. Think about small bird flickers. We, we all see those constantly, a Tweety taking flight. That's about the same movement you are going to see from game in close quarters. Tail wags, cud chewing, ear wiggles, head turns. Because bedded animals move less, I stop for longer periods of time with my optic, right? 
you generally see movement when the optic is still not panning, right? So if you grid pan or whatever, um, when you're glassing typically, you're gonna need to stop for longer periods of time. I also stop when glassing big country, but generally only for 10 to 15 seconds. If I'm glassing a thick bedding area, I might have the optic stationary for 45 seconds to a minute before I continue to pan. And guys, when you're short range glassing, always double check movement, don't write it off. It's gonna be smaller and more meticulous. All right guys, so another thing to look for is look at the vegetation. There's some animal behavior that creates movement in the plants that you see, not the actual animal. Fall bears are the obvious example because in short range glassing scenarios, they can be 100% obscured by a canopy, right? But they pull on the branches while feeding. Those branches will whip and shake. Bull elk can also create this effect with their antlers if they're bedded in thick stuff. When they turn their head, they hit, they hit the vegetation and it shakes and whips. If you are hunting on a calm day, almost, you know, almost no wind, this type of movement can be a game changer. On windy days, looking for vegetation movement is tricky. It's moving on its own and that camouflages these game related movements. But it's kind of like a guy that gets tuned in on seeing antelope on the plains, right? Or morel mushrooms when you're mushroom hunting. Once you see the vegetation move a bunch from game, you will actually be able to tell the difference. It's typically more of a whip or a shake and less of a wave, right, that the wind creates in that vegetation. You're gonna see a shake or a whip. And honestly, it's just like I said, like, you know, you're out there with a guy um, who's been, you know, hunting the antelope for two weeks straight and you just show up, you can't see any of them, but he's picking them like, picking them out like crazy. It's just because his brain's tuning in and you'll figure that out. The other movement related strategy I use at short ranges, I'll explain by analogy. You know those games that kids play, you know, what's the difference between this picture and this picture? Find the five things that are different or whatever. I'm sure you've seen kids play these, you know, little brain teasers. When you were working one type of vegetation with your glass at essentially one distance, you can play this game and it turns out our brains and eyes are naturally pretty damn good at it. If you were glassing a 200 yard by 400 yard bench, right, a nice little rectangle, in 30 minutes of glassing, you are going to have visual pictures of things there. This tree lays against this tree. That large diameter tree is surrounded by this smaller diameter tree. Oh, I've already looked at that branch thinking it was a bull antler four or five times, right? We've all been there. You start to develop these visual pictures. So when that picture changes, you know, a cow gets up, to stretch in the timber, all of a sudden you can see your tail dock. A bull turns his head and now there's a new branch you haven't seen before. Just those little things like that. They are super obvious when you're close range glassing and the picture has changed. So try to play that game in your mind. The second big one that I use, and this is leveraging the single vegetation type component of short range glassing, is patterns and lines. I use this a ton probably my main go-to when I'm glassing real close. So what I mean is how the lines intersect amongst the vegetation. If you were glassing a healthy aspen grove, all the lines are running up and down, right? Very few lines are sideways. There's not perpendicular uh, trunks to the live trunks. This is the same for healthy timber. So if you catch a horizontal line, look at it harder. A lot of the time, that is how I find game in th super thick, you know, jungly aspens or thick timber. What I see is I see the back of the animal, right? I see the back of the animal intersecting all those live up and down, you know, vertical lines. Now in deadfall filled timber or even dying aspen groves, you know, these areas are common bedding, bedding areas. Game likes that matchstick formation that, you know, you find in those areas. You can still use this vegetation method. method. All of the low deadfall, like flat on the ground, will be a certain height against the trees. Also, it'll be straight. A game animal's back is going to be a little higher up and have some roundness to it, right? That roundness is a lot of times what you'll pick up on. It won't be straight like a tree. It'll be a little bit of roundness. In close range glassing, a lot of the time you won't glass up an obvious feature of the animal, not even an ear, right, or a nose or an antler. You are just gonna glass up a line that, that is odd in relation to the vegetation. With, spur, with further inspection or just waiting on it, all of a sudden you're gonna turn up a buck or a bull, right? The other thing that is more useful to folks in short range glassing situation is situations is focusing on color differential. This is taking advantage of the single vegetation backdrop and the single aspect of terrain that we talked about earlier. 
If I'm looking at timber, I know the greens, the dark browns. If I'm looking at aspens, I know the light greens, the black spots, the varying degrees of white on the trunks. Think about when you're just glassing wide open sagebrush from a long range, right? At this angle, the sagebrush is gonna look damn near white. At another angle, it's gonna look black. At this distance, it's gonna be somewhere in between, right? There's tons of different varying colors, right? You don't have to deal with that in short range glassing, so use it to your advantage. Think about those colors. Because you're looking at one distance and typically one angle to the sun, the colors are pretty uniform when short range glassing. Use this to your advantage. Look for the lighter or darker patches. If you see one, wait on it. Maybe change your angle slightly and all of a sudden the game animal will be there. This stuff is pretty damn nuanced guys, but I'm telling you it works. If you guys have your own things that you focus on when glassing in the thick stuff from short distances, please leave a comment. I wanna hear what you guys use, particularly the guys that are just always hunting this kind of country. I'm sure there are things you guys are doing that I haven't mentioned here, so let me know. But that's where my tactics are a bit differentiated between long range and short range glassing. First, movement and having the sight picture change, right? Do it playing that game looking for lines, not actual pieces of game animal, and using color. If you overweight those strategies when you are glassing short distances, you are gonna find way more game. Now for a big caution for you guys when it comes to short range glassing. If you watch my channel much, you know that I lean into heuristics, right? People try to focus on too many things at once. This goes for hunting, finding happiness in life, just about anything. There are always a few things you can focus on, you know, rules of thumb, that if you stick to and perfect, you will garner 95 plus percent of the goal, right? One of these heuristics in hunting is the importance of finding the 10% of the landmass that is currently holding 90% of the game. Almost all great hunters are phenomenal at this. I mentioned this in a lot of my videos. You know, that one video that's, that's quite popular, the why 5% of hunters kill 95% of the elk, I talk about it a lot. So herein lies the caution. Getting caught up short range glassing can be the antithesis of this if you apply it at the wrong time. The one time to not even think about short range glassing is when you don't know the subset of landmass that is holding the game. Short range glassing sessions are for when you have a high expectation of game in that area. Be cautious of when you use it. Here's some scenarios that I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't use it. There's no indicator of game in the area or you're going on a hunch. In those situations, use classic techniques to narrow down the country, right? First, if you can, use wide, long-range glassing. The other thing is you can still hunt the country and the trails for sign, and then during archery season for elk, you can always use calls to locate animals. The other thing to think about is when you're short-range glassing, you have to be real cautious of the fact that you're within kind of the, you know, the danger circle that the game has, has out there, right? I talk about this in my stocking videos and that sort of thing. But, you know, game animals, depending on how much pressure they have, the species, whatever, they kind of have a, you know, a realm of, you know, area where if they get threatened within that area, they're going to leave, they're going to booger or whatever. You know, it might be 500 yards, it might be 1,000 yards, whatever. But typically when you're short-range glassing, you're within that. So unlike long-range glassing where you're kind of, you've kind of put yourself outside of the hunt for a moment and you're glassing. You know, you don't worry about eating snacks and being a little bit loud. You don't worry as much about your wind. When you're short range glassing, you, you have to think about those things. You're actually in the hunt at that time. You could find an animal at any moment when you're short range glassing and literally have a shot within moments. But you could also have an animal pop up, see you and depart the area because you're close, right? So when you're setting up to do short range glassing sessions, you need to think about the wind, right? You're not blowing your wind right into that bedding area, that sort of thing. You're not close enough to the bedding area that swirls are gonna pick up your scent and send it down in there. So you have to be cognizant of that. You have to limit the noise, that sort of things. You're hunting when you're in those short range glassing sessions. So you just gotta keep that in mind when you're doing this stuff. And sometimes you just can't short range glass an area because of those variables, right? The, the animal's gonna see you, you have no cover to glass from, the wind's bad, those sort of things. So in those scenarios, don't apply it. Move on to another tactic or just be patient until you can you can glass or the animals move out of that thick habitat or whatever, get out of their beds later in the day, that sort of thing. Just realize there's a time and a place for short range glassing. Don't just push it on everything. All right, guys, I hope you find the video useful to you. Good luck out there, guys. Thanks.